Okay, this is a review of trig identities, particularly so that we are more prepared for evaluating trig integrals in a Calculus 2 course. So we won't do too much calculus here, um, but this page, don't look too closely, but it's giving us a general overview of how we might evaluate an integral that involves a product of trig functions, such as the following. Um, so I could have sine to some power multiplied by cosine to some power. So in the midst of calculus two, these four different items here would really be of great use to determine how we might integrate. Um, but we're going to work on just making sure we're comfortable with the identities that are used in, the, in these strategies. So glancing quickly through all these words, you'll notice um, an identity here, cosine squared of x is equal to 1 minus sine squared of x. That probably sounds somewhat familiar. Another familiar identity is sine squared of x equals 1 minus cosine squared of x. That's just another form of the first identity. Um, and then down on the bottom here you'll see, again, something that might look familiar from uh, your trig days. So we're just going to review where these identities come from so that when you need them in the midst of Calc 2, they're more readily available to you. Uh, I find that when I know where something comes from, I'm much more likely to remember it. So don't focus so much on all the words on the page, but really the identities. So one of my very favorite things is the Pythagorean theorem. And just to remind ourselves uh, from trigonometry, if I go ahead and sketch a triangle in quadrant one, doesn't really matter, but I'll put it here in quadrant one, we can say that taking the horizontal value here x and squaring it and adding to it the vertical value here y and squaring that uh, will be equal to the length of the hypotenuse squared. And if I give our reference angle at the base here theta, oops that doesn't really look like a theta, alright that's a theta, um, then shortly we'll see why we need that. But the Pythagorean theorem as we know and love it can be readily adapted to feel more like trig. And by that I mean if we take the Pythagorean identity and simply manipulate it by choosing to divide through by either x squared or y squared or r squared, we generate three identities that are commonly called the Pythagorean identities. So let's go ahead and divide every term by r squared in this case. So every term of the theorem gets divided by r squared. Cleaning up a little bit, um, x squared over r squared is really the same as x over r quantity squared. Similarly, y squared over r squared is the same as y over r quantity squared. And r squared over r squared, of course, would just be 1. This is where our sketch at the right comes back into play. What we may recall from our trig days is uh, SOHCAHTOA or the different ratios we have from trigonometry. So um, if we thought about cosine, the cosine ratio is the adjacent side, which in our sketch is x, divided by the hypotenuse, which is just r in our sketch. Similarly, uh, the sine ratio from trig was the opposite side, which is y, divided by the hypotenuse. So looking back at where we are with uh, this x over r kind of stuff, we can now replace x over r with cosine. Similarly, we can replace y over r with sine. And when we're squaring trig functions, another way to write that is just uh, nesting the exponent between the trig function's name and the argument. So more commonly, we'd see this written as cosine squared theta plus sine squared of theta is equal to 1. And this, my friends, is probably the most well-known of the three Pythagorean identities. In calculus, too, you just want to feel very um, flexible with how you write this identity. By that, I mean we may as well have written this identity as cosine squared of theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared theta, 
that would be from just subtracting sine squared from both sides. Or we could have just as well have said sine squared of theta is equal to one minus cosine squared of theta. So when we're talking about evaluating trigonometric integrals in Calc 2, probably these two, which I'll bubble off here, are most relevant. So this should all feel somewhat familiar, but hopefully it jogs your memory and makes you really feel like those Pythagorean identities from trig are accessible to you as far as where they come from. Um, so I like to think that I don't really memorize identities, although when you use them enough you remember them, but it's more like we really understand where they come from. So let's take a look at one other uh, identity from our trig days. You may or may not remember this one. I don't have this one memorized, but uh, it's the sum identity for cosine. And playing around with this identity will produce a useful result for Calc 2. So what we're going to try out here is taking this identity, but instead of inserting two different angles A and B, let's just pass in the same angle twice. So I'm just going to say theta plus theta. And then we'll follow what the identity tells us to do. So cosine of theta, cosine of theta, minus sine of theta, sine of theta, because again in our case both angles were the same. So on the left this means we really have cosine of 2 theta. On the right, cosine times cosine could just as readily be written as cosine squared. Sine times sine is sine squared. So we're getting to the stage that says cosine of 2 theta is equal to cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. What I'd like to do here, again, we kind of have to have our end goal in mind to know what to do next, but I'd like to get the right-hand side to be solely in terms of cosine or sine. It doesn't matter, so maybe during this video we'll say let's get it all in terms of cosine. And then in the practice tied to this video I'll have you do both. So that tells me that I need to stare at this sine squared term and think about a way to rewrite it in terms of cosine. So as I'm getting to that stage, I hope you're all kind of thinking through what that might be. Turns out it was actually on the previous page, right? A moment ago we saw how to rewrite sine squared in terms of cosine squared. If you need to pause and kind of come up with it yourself, please feel free to do so. But we're going to go ahead and say sine squared was equivalent to 1 minus cosine squared. So just to show you that again from our previous page, we're just using this fact right here. So cosine squared is the same as 1 minus sine squared. Oh sorry, we're using this one. We're saying that sine squared is the same as 1 minus cosine squared. Alrighty, so now if we clean up, we have cosine of 2 theta equaling cosine squared minus 1 plus cosine squared. So that sounds like we actually have two positive cosine squared terms minus 1. And this is all looking great, but again I need to keep indicating what our end goal is. Now that I have the right hand side fully in terms of cosine, I just want to solve for cosine squared. So I'm going to say now that 2 cosine squared of theta is equal to 1 plus cosine of 2 theta, just by adding that one to the other side. Oops, I was going to see if I can get some more space here, maybe. Nope, all right. So we're just going to go ahead and divide by 2, it looks like, and that would free up our cosine term. So we'll go ahead and say that cosine squared theta is equal to half of what we had, which was 1 plus cosine of 2 theta. I know that's written pretty tight, so we'll go ahead and move to the next slide so we'll rewrite this. But what we just found is that cosine of 2 theta is the same as 1 half of 1 plus cosine 2 theta. Nope, cosine squared of theta. There we go. All right, let's go back and make sure we got that all. So cosine squared of theta is the same as half of 1 plus cosine of 2 theta. All right, there we go. Perfect. So
This identity is going to be extremely useful in uh, Calc 2, but again, at least for me, it helps to know where it comes from. So what I'll have you all do in the practice exercises with this video is to verify um, that sine squared of theta is one half of one minus cosine of two theta. So you can try that on your own, basically using very similar process to what we did here. Um, all right, so let's end this by just doing a little bit of calculus because I know you probably wanted to do some. Um, since we're talking about trigonometric integrals, we know a little bit about integrating sine and cosine, but what is the integral of tangent? And this lends itself nicely to our discussion of identities because um, as it sits, we don't know the antiderivative of tangent, but we do know that tangent is the same as sine over cosine. That's just using our quotient identity um, from trig. And when we rewrite our integrand in that way, we now have more of a u substitution type feel, which is why I just wrote du a second ago. Sorry about that. So as we look at this and consider how to use techniques we already know, which really would be u substitution, if we let u be the denominator, then that means the derivative of cosine would be negative sine when taken with respect to x. So we could then rewrite this integral as we'd really have negative 1 over u du. So let's just match up our pieces real quick. We're saying that the denominator, which is cosine, is fully replaced by u. We're saying that sine of x dx is really the same as negative du. So the sine of x dx is being fully replaced by negative du. And this now looks like something we know how to integrate. So integrating 1 over something just comes back as the natural log of the absolute value of that something. This is indefinite, so we'll tag on plus c. If we back substitute, this means we have the negative natural log of cosine of x plus c. So that's one way you could write the integral of tangent. Another very common way to write this is actually to think about the negative out front of the logarithm. Of course, it's just a coefficient of negative 1. And log properties say that that can be thrown up as the exponent. So if I think about this as the natural log of cosine of x to the negative 1 plus c, that's just saying the reciprocal of cosine. And we happen to know that the reciprocal of cosine is secant. So the way we're writing it right here is probably in a textbook the way you'd see it written. Um, looks a little bit uh, more friendly because it doesn't have a negative. So just for fun at the end, we did a little calculus there. Uh, we now can say that the integral of tangent is the natural log of the absolute value of secant plus c. So hopefully you're loving trig, and we will get to some trig integrals very soon.